Um, thank you all for joining us today for our first grand rounds of the year. I hope everyone had a uh, pleasant, safe, and healthy holidays. Um, my name is Danielle. I'm one of the PGY4s in the uh, FR program here in London, and I'm presenting grand rounds today, first grand rounds of the year. Um, and the title of the grand rounds is Staying Alive. We'll be reviewing some of the evidence for and against uh, mechanical CPR, uh, both in the pre-hospital and uh, emergency department settings. My supervisor for this grand, grand rounds is uh, Dr. Adam Ducolo. So I have no disclosures, nor do I have any conflicts of interest on this topic uh, to declare at this point. And I just want to start off by saying a very fervent thank you, uh, both to Dr. Adam Ducolo, uh, who supervises grand rounds amidst the million other things that he is required to do on a daily basis, uh, found time to review and give me some feedback. Um, as well, I want to say a quick thank you to Dr. Lauren Valdis with our Southwestern Ontario Regional Based Hospital Program and Mr. Jay Loosley with our uh, Middlesex London Paramedic Service, both of who are instrumental in giving me some insights into how these devices are being used locally uh, in our London community. So thank you to all of the above, uh, without whom this grand rounds would not be possible. So I just want to start off our discussion. We will move to a discussion about mechanical CPR, but I think um, it's very valid to start uh, from the point of CPR in general, and how do we know what we want the mechanical CPR to achieve? Um, and so I took a relatively deep dive and I've summarized for you a brief history of uh, CPR as we know it, which actually dates back to the 1500s. So back in the 1530s uh, was sort of the first time mentioned in the literature where we made attempts to revive those who were not, um, not living, I guess, at that point. Predominantly, these were drowning patients and we were using crude methods, including those things that we could find by the fireplace, uh, such as bellows to try to provide artificial ventilation. About 200 years ago, we can actually say thank you to our veterinarian colleagues. Um, this is Peter Abdelgaard, a Danish veterinarian, who is the first to discover uh, the concept of defibrillation. So he discovered that after he shocking a chicken um, to render it lifeless, he was actually able to countershock the chest to restore a heartbeat. So the first to sort of coin that idea. Again, skipping forward about 100 years um, in London, England, the other London, um, two physicians, Marshall Hull on the left-hand side and Henry Sylvester on the right-hand side, uh, started to look into non-invasive methods for ventilating patients. So the Hull method uh, was essentially alternating, alternating repositioning the patient from supine to a lateral decubitus position. And then he updated the, uh, the approach later by adding pressure to the thorax to provide expiratory uh, energy. On the right-hand side, we have the Sylvester method where he had the what was called the chest pressure arm lift method, pretty self-explanatory. He would raise the patient's arms up to expand the chest and then cross the arms over the chest to apply expiratory pressure. And so these were both seen as non-invasive ways to provide some ventilation, again, predominantly for drowning patients. About 20 years later, a German surgeon, um, for those who don't read German, this is the Berlin Clinical Weekly publication, uh, but a German surgeon, Dr. Friedrich Moss, actually used external compressions uh, to restart the heart of two young human patients and published this uh, in the Berlin Clinical Weekly. He was the first to advocate for chest compressions rather than just ventilation alone uh, to help with circulation. However, the technique really didn't take hold and for about 50 more years, open heart massage was the standard of care. Until 1933, when this gentleman, Dr. Cowenhoven, uh, who was an electrical engineer at Johns Hopkins, accidentally rediscovered external compressions and he reproduced his technique in about 100 dog models and found that compression on the dog's sternum could provide adequate circulation to the brain to keep the animal alive until defibrillation could restart the heart. He joined forces with these two gentlemen, uh, Dr. James Alam and Dr. Peter Safar, uh, who were working on mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation at Hopkins as well. And in 1960, uh, Drs. Cowenhoven, Alam, and Safar joined forces to bring mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation uh, to chest compressions and put together the construct that we now know as uh, CPR. Around the same time uh, at Hopkins, they were unveiling the first external defibrillator, which is down in the right-hand corner of the slide there. So really, we've come a long way in the past several hundred years, um, but even considering that in the 50s, we were just putting uh, chest compressions and ventilations together, we've come a long way. Uh, to the construct that we now understand to be CPR with our compression and ventilatory ratios. And so we're pretty fortunate now that we have a construct that's widely accepted internationally, taught to healthcare providers, but also taught to lay people. And so our current construct question, what makes good quality CPR? Uh, 
And so maybe at this point, I'll pick on one of our uh, PGY2s. Um, Dan Corpal, I think, is here. I thought I saw him. So Dan, uh, you and I have had some chats recently. I know you've been on CCU and CCTC recently. You've led some codes in the Emerge Department, you know, on CCU, on CCTC. Um, so you have been in a code team leader position. You have been the one in charge of the quality of the resuscitation, the quality of the CPR. What sorts of things are you looking for in your compressions? Um, and what sorts of things are you coaching your compression, compressors to work on? Sure. So uh, hard and fast. Uh, so they, they kind of alluded to it. The, the guidelines now are 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Uh, in terms of hard, you want uh, at least a third of the chest depth um, in terms of when you're doing your compression. Uh, anatomically, you want the correct location. You want them located directly over the sternum, um, through the maxial load uh, down through it. Uh, you also want to minimize uh, the time of interruption, uh, but you also want to keep your the person doing the compressions fresh, so um, frequently changing every two minutes the person doing the compression. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Um, great job, and I guess I should mention you're also an ACLS instructor, so lots of, lots of expertise there even in our, uh, in our junior residents, which is phenomenal to see. Um, so 100% agree with you. The guidelines are pretty clear about what makes up good CPR. Um, and Dan, you're off the hook now, but my question when I read those guidelines is how do we know? Um, we're fortunate to have the guidelines, but is there any evidence that sort of supports those metrics that we're trying to achieve? Um, so some of the metrics that Dan alluded to, including sort of, he talked about pushing hard. Um, and so depth of compressions and that being important. And we certainly have, um, I pulled out a couple of articles for each uh, metric just to give you a sense of the literature that's out there. There's quite the uh, body of evidence in the last 20 years or so. So I haven't reviewed it all for you here today, but just to give you a sense, we have some evidence that tells us that deeper chest compressions are associated with improved survival and functional outcome. So we have uh, evidence that links patient-centered uh, outcomes to these CPR metrics. Similarly, we wanna push fast, but not too fast. And Dan alluded to that uh, 100 to 120 beats per minute being our target uh, heart rate. And again, we have evidence that chest compression rate is associated with ROS. We want to allow full recoil from the chest. So we want to make sure that we get hands off the chest in between our different compressions. And again, supported by evidence from about 10 years ago showing that leaning on the chest substantially decreases coronary perfusion pressure, cardiac index, and myocardial blood flow. We know we want to minimize interruptions and the kind of phrase or the term that's come into vogue of late is the chest compression fraction. So the percentage of time that we are providing good quality chest compressions relative to the time that we're off the chest. And furthermore, we have evidence that tells us that when we increase our chest compression fraction, that is an independent predictor of better survival for our patients. So as the code team leader, as the person you know, in charge of resuscitation or as the person providing those compressions, obviously we wanna provide good quality CPR. Um, obviously, I don't think any of us want to read all of the papers that are available on this topic because they're quite extensive, um, but we're very fortunate that a, we have a body that does that for us. So we have the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, who meet every five years to review all of the newest evidence, put it into the context of the pre-existing evidence, uh, and provide us with the best evidence-based guidelines available. Those guidelines then trickle down through our more regional associations. And here in Canada, we use the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada uh, guidelines, which are modified from the American Heart Association guidelines. And in their most recent 2020 update, um, they made a point of reaffirming the importance of good quality CPR, reaffirming that uh, the depth of compressions is important, that the rate of compressions is important. Um, and they actually, this is one of the very first uh, paragraphs in their entire executive summary, which is the well over 100 pages. Um, so reaffirming the importance of good quality CPR in that particular document. So let's assume for a minute that I've convinced you or the American Heart Association Heart and Stroke have convinced you um, that good quality CPR leads to improved outcomes. The next question that kind of I think logically flows is um, what limits our ability to perform good quality CPR? So again, I'll ask one of our junior residents, how about Steph? Uh, Steph Chilton, are you there? Um, again, you've now had an opportunity to be both in a leadership um, and a team uh, component of a code. What sorts of things have you seen pragmatically, either pre-hospital in the emergency department on the floor, what types of things stop you or prevent your uh, colleagues from doing good quality CPR? Uh, yeah, hey DK, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yep. So 
practically speaking, I think a lot of the times environmental things get in the way. So like from a pre-hospital perspective, um, like prolonged extrications, patient transfers, um, transports, like being in the back of a moving car also makes it tricky to get good high quality CPR. Um, having limited personnel too, if you don't have enough folks there that can, um, like someone to be committed to doing CPR and then enough people to switch out. Oftentimes I feel like there's more times like an abundance of people um, that run to codes, which can also play into it if it's a bit hectic and um, everybody's kind of focusing on like airway or something else that's maybe a bit distracting. Sometimes can take away from the CPR aspect of it. Um, those would be, I think, kind of some of the big ones I've seen. Yeah, great. I think those are all sort of very practical, pragmatic uh, limitations to the quality CPR. Um, and I think we've probably all experienced at least some of those. Uh, if we were all sitting together in a big room, as I wish we could, uh, in a pre-COVID world, I'd ask everyone who's performed CPR in their lifetime to raise their hand, and I expect many of you would. Um, and then the next question would be, how exhausted were you after, and were you surprised by that? Because that was the thing that strikes me most about CPR, was the first time I did it as a medical student, was how physically exhausting it was um, to actually perform CPR for any extended period of time, and how much of an actual exertion that was. So. Mm -hmm. Again, we do have evidence to support that there are certain uh, features that limit the quality of our CPR. So extended interruptions. Um, I believe one of our PGY1s, Colin, tells the story of a prolonged extrication uh, from his pre-medicine life when he was a paramedic um, and talks about ex extracting a patient um, essentially straight down a, fl a vertical flight of stairs and trying to perform CPR. Uh, on a patient who's almost falling off the stretcher and who's being transported vertically. And you can understand that there's extremes uh, that would cause difficulty, but then even as much as loading a patient into and out of, um, into and out of an ambulance can certainly uh, hamper, hamper the quality of our CPR, um, which is again, borne out by uh, the evidence. The other uh, thing that Steph alluded to is that fatigue factor. Um, so this particular study I thought was interesting, not only because as logically flows, chest compression quality declined significantly over this study period. But these authors actually found that when they interviewed the uh, compressors afterwards, the compressors were unaware that they were providing inadequate uh, compressions. So they felt like they were still doing good quality compressions when the science said that that was not the case. And this, I think, is the point at which mechanical CPR becomes very attractive. Um, because mechanical CPR, at least on the surface and at least logically, eliminates many of the issues and many of the limitations to good quality CPR that, um, that we see on a daily basis. For the purposes of our discussion today, just to make sure that the kind of nomenclature is a bit clear, um, we'll call mechanical CPR anything that's delivered by an automated device uh, providing chest compressions during a cardiac arrest, whereas manual CPR will be any human performed uh, compressions. When we talk about uh, mechanical CPR, we have two sort of prototypical um, devices and two sort of schools of thought. On the left hand side, you'll see the autopulse device, which is the prototype for the load distributing band uh, category. So essentially, it's a band that wraps concentrically around the chest and provides concentric uh, contraction to the chest wall. Whereas on the right hand side, you'll see Lucas, uh, which may look very familiar to many of us um, as it arrives frequently in our emergency departments here in London. Um, and Lucas is a point to press device where we have a plunger sort of in the center that uh, compresses the lower part of the sternum similar to manual compressions. So the question is, what are we using here locally? What can we expect to see in our emergency departments here in London? Um, and here in the local uh, paramedic service, we're predominantly using Lucas. The only exception to that is the Oxford paramedic service, which has been using the autopulse. Um, here in Middlesex, London, we have 10 devices. There's one device in each of the county stations, uh, so just outside of the city, and three devices which are in supervisor vehicles um, able to respond to cardiac arrest within the city. So the supervisor vehicle would go if, it's, if there's a VSA um, happening and bring the device. These devices are preset to compress uh, the chest 2.1 inches at 102 beats per minute. They have a 45 minute battery life and they do have an AC plug-in. Um, so if you're reaching the end of your battery life, you can plug the device in. Uh, locally, as far as indications or contraindications, the only contraindication that's being used, practically speaking here in the city, is if you are physically too big or physically too small for the device to work. Um, there's no other contraindications. 
our paramedics here are using these on pregnant patients, on pediatric patients, as long as they're not uh, so small that the device can't deliver compressions. Um, to contrast Middlesex London, in Windsor, there's uh, one of these devices in every truck, which is obviously a big financial decision to make for paramedic service, um, but that's the way that Windsor has gone. Here in London, um, speaking to, to Jay, it sounds like we're using them about two to three times a week on average. Uh, and if needed in the emergency department, they would be uh, made available to us. So I can speak, you know, anecdotally, I've had a couple of cardiac arrests, particularly hypothermic arrests, where we anticipated doing compressions for an extended period of time during active rewarming. And so we actually were able to contact the 24-hour uh, superintendent on call, the duty officer, uh, who was able to bring a device to the emergency department um, and help us deploy it. So just to give you a sense, like I said, we're using, you'll predominantly see Lucas um, coming to any of the London emergency departments. And to give you kind of a visual of what that looks like, I do have a video. Um, the caveat to this video is it is a promotional video from Lucas. Um, so obviously there are some potential biases and I think that, you know, I would take with a grain of salt any claims that are made in the video, but it does show the process of applying the device, kind of what it looks like and the two pieces. There's a back plate and then there's an anterior portion that snaps on. So it'll give you a sense, hopefully, of what it looks like to apply the device and then also um, a sense of the time that it takes to apply the device. Lucas is a simple and intuitive portable device for external cardiac compressions. Lucas can be easily stored and carried in a backpack. After the back plate is placed under the patient, it takes less than 20 seconds to stop manual compressions, connect the upper part of Lucas, and start mechanical compressions. In almost all situations, Lucas can provide effective, consistent, uninterrupted cardiac compressions in accordance with international guidelines. With Lucas providing compressions, rescuers have hands-free for other life-saving care. It can be used by ALS and BLS responders out of hospital and by code teams, cath labs and emergency departments in hospital. Use it to treat patients following the same protocols as for manual CPR. Lucas allows for effective compressions during patient transport and safety for both the patient and personnel. Now let's step through the basics of how... So I'll stop the video there. For anyone who's interested, I'm happy to provide the link because um, it really walks through how to use the device. Um, practically speaking, in our emergency departments, if the device uh, arrives on a patient, uh, the paramedics have all been told that they are expected to um, stick around to help us run the device. Um, and any of the paramedics are trained in how to apply or remove the device. So again, I wish we could all be in person so I could uh, get one of these devices to demonstrate for you, but um, feel free to hit me up for the link for that video afterwards. Um, but I do think the video highlights a couple of the important sort of at least theoretical pros and cons of these devices. So the pros, um, which I think we've kind of touched on already, is that these devices don't get tired. They're preset. They're going to provide consistent compressions as long as they're plugged in, as long as they're applied appropriately. Um, so it really frees up a set of hands especially in low resource settings. So we've talked about um, in the back of an ambulance, we've talked about our county crews where you may have um, two paramedics and no other hands to provide compressions. And so if you can offload one of those sets of hands to do other tasks, um, obviously that's a huge, uh, a huge benefit. Uh, potentially there are some fewer, like fewer interruptions in compressions. So you saw, watched in the video that they applied the Lucas and then the Lucas continued to give compressions even as they were extricating the patient up a set of stairs, as they were loading the patient in the ambulance. And then there's um, at one, at least one of the big appeals locally is EMS crew safety. Um, so our paramedics are without these devices providing compressions in the back of a moving ambulance um, that's moving at relatively high speeds through cities, um, obviously a high risk situation and those sort of acceleration forces on our paramedics can uh, be a big safety concern. And so if we can apply the Lucas, then the majority of the other tasks that our paramedics have to do in the back of the ambulance can be done from a seated position with a seatbelt on. Um, so seated at the head of the patient, providing ventilation or seated beside the patient, um, getting access or giving drugs. So many potential pros. And I think that's where the attraction of these devices has really, uh, really taken off. The downside to these devices, and at least speaking practically to our crews, is that 
here in London, they're not always available. Um, so hopefully the supervisor vehicle gets there on time, but they're also heavy to transport. So to carry this device up a large flight of stairs or to carry a patient who then has this device applied um, can make it a bit unwieldy. They take some time to apply. So in that video with that sort of highly rehearsed team in an ideal situation with a mannequin, um, by my count, it took about 20 seconds to apply the device, 10 seconds for the backboard and 10 seconds for the uh, anterior portion. We really get no feedback on compression. So the device is not telling you to push harder, push faster. The device is gonna consistently uh, compress to a depth of 2.1 inches, even if it's compressing over the liver, even if it's compressing uh, higher on the sternum than we would like. So malposition can be a big concern. So if we're not paying attention to the positioning, every time we move the patient, um, these devices, I've seen, had many anecdotal cases where these devices have been malpositioned. And when we finally realized that, we realized we had not been giving adequate compressions for a period of time. And then there's a theoretical risk, uh, or at least it's been sort of touted uh, theoretically that there might be more injuries with these devices. Um, and we'll uh, chat about that a little bit shortly. So when we talk about the basic physiology of what these things do, uh, most resuscitation studies, anytime we get a new gadget in medicine, we do a bunch of physiology studies and we put catheters in all the blood vessels and we try to get a sense of what is happening physiologically with these devices. And so I've, again, there's hundreds of these papers. I've pulled out a few that I thought were illustrative. Um, and I just looked at the low distributing band devices because that's uh, what happened to be the theme that I picked. Um, so again, just to give you a sense of what is out there, not to do a comprehensive review by any stretch. Um, but when we look at the autopulse device, we have some evidence from about 10 years ago that when we apply these devices, we get increased diastolic and mean blood pressures um, relative to our manual chest compressions. We can get increased coronary perfusion pressure, again, relative to our manual chest compressions, which is uh, you know, if we're looking at trying to get ROSC, coronary perfusion pressure is going to be very important. These devices can produce pre-level, uh, pre-arrest levels of myocardial and cerebral blood flow, again, based on our hemodynamic studies, which begs the question, why are we not using these devices as the standard of care absolutely everywhere? Um, and that speaks a little bit to the, to the cons that we discussed, I guess, of these devices. Um, this was an abstract published in 2019 as part of a larger RCT, but they did, looked at a subgroup um, and they looked at the pauses associated with applying these devices. And the median pause associated with applying the back plate was about seven seconds. Um, however, in about 16% of cases, it exceeded 10 seconds. And we're taught in CPR and all of our BLS courses, ACLS, that we want to keep our uh, compression pauses to less than 10 seconds. So in 16% of cases, we were, we were exceeding that to deploy the back plate. To deploy the upper plate seems, or the upper part seems to take a little bit longer. So on median of eight seconds, but in about 25% of cases, it was more than 10 seconds. So potentially some, uh, some significant delays there. Um, and if you have ever taken CPR, taught CPR, taken ACLS into any sort of resuscitation talk, you've seen this graph, um, which when we move from left to right, we start with the continuous compressions with the best possible perfusion pressure. And then we halt our compressions, that perfusion pressure falls to essentially zero. Um, and what I think many of us forget, or what I frequently have to remind myself is that when we start compressions again, we don't immediately get to that best possible scenario where we're getting good quality perfusion. We have a period of time where we have to regain that perfusion pressure that we had previously. So every time we halt compressions or every time we hold compressions and for, the, for any duration, we lose, we lose ground and we have an extended period where we may have inadequate perfusion, even if we're providing compressions again. So that time delay has been touted as one of the concerns with these devices. The other concern, and we alluded to it earlier, is displacement of the device. Um, so I have a little transesophageal echo clip uh, here to show you, which essentially shows, for those who aren't totally familiar with TEE, um, at the top of the uh, screen, you'll see the atrium. Uh, and in the atrium, there's quite a large inter uh, interluminal thrombus. Um, or intracardiac thrombus rather, and you'll see the ventricle sort of extending vertically just below. And when I play the clip, you'll see uh, this was a patient who came in with the Lucas on. Um, they already had an airway, so the TEE was dropped quite quickly, and you'll see the compressions that are happening uh, with the Lucas are really not providing much compression at all uh, of that uh, ventricle. So with the, when the device is displaced or inadequately, in, inappropriately placed, um, there is potential that we are not 
getting the, the quality of compressions that we expect. So we've talked a lot about the theoretical risks and benefits, pros and cons of these devices, but I think we're probably all, or at least I was thinking, you know, what does the actual evidence say in a pragmatic setting, in a non-ideal setting, without catheters measuring uh, perfusion pressures and all of the hemodynamic parameters, what actually happens when we apply these devices? So I sort of divided the evidence, and the, the evidence has been divided, I guess, if you will, into three settings. The first setting um, is the pre-hospital setting. It's by far the most heavily studied uh, group where these are being used, and you can see that in our local practices as well. Um, we'll look very briefly at the in-hospital uh, cardiac arrest setting and then at the emergency department settings, both of which are um, areas in which we still don't have a lot of information. When we look at the pre-hospital setting, um, like I said, this is by far the uh, most adequately studied uh, setting. We have three sort of landmark RCTs, the paramedic trial, the CERC trial, and the LINK trial, um, which will come up a little bit later. So I just wanted to kind of mention them here. Um, and fortunately, we have a meta-analysis that was able to uh, look at and review all of the studies that are available in the pre-hospital setting. So they looked at a total of nine randomized controlled trials, including those three that we just mentioned, which were by far the largest and most well-performed. And they looked as well at six cohort studies. And they looked at some very important, I think, outcomes. The first outcome being rates of ROSC. And so when we look at rates of ROSC, we had six uh, randomized controlled trials that looked at this. And really, we don't see any significant differences between mechanical compressions and manual compressions. Um, and what I like about this RCT, or sorry, this systematic review and meta-analysis a lot is that they looked at all mechanical CPR versus manual CPR, but they also looked at manual CPR versus autopulse, and they looked at manual CPR versus Lucas. Um, and so they were able to comment as to whether this was a mechanical CPR full group effect or whether this depended on the type of device. So when we looked at rates of ROSC, there were no differences between mechanical CPR and manual CPR, and there were also no differences between Lucas or autopulse and manual CPR. So really overall, um, no significant differences. When we look again at another important outcome, survival to hospital admission, so that short-term survival, we again in all of the groups see no significant difference. When we talk about hospital, survival to hospital discharge, we had eight randomized controlled trials that looked uh, at this particular outcome. There were no differences uh, in the pooled group and no differences in the subgroups. And then finally, when we look at the cerebral performance category or CPC scores, and this is a score used in a lot of these resuscitation studies as a marker of neurological outcome. Again, we see that there are no significant differences um, in the pooled mechanical CPR or when we break it down into Lucas or autopulse. So really, you know, when it, when it all comes down to it, we're not seeing significant differences in any of these patient-centered outcomes. We're not seeing that patients are doing significantly better uh, when we do mechanical CPR as we might have you know, theorized based on our previous discussions. A couple of notes to make about the randomized controlled trials that were included here um, that were not necessarily included in the pooled analyses. So when we look at the LINK and the CERC trials, the median reported pause in chest compressions that was uh, reported for the device deployment was about 36 seconds. Um, and so it took 36 seconds upfront to apply the device. However, what both of those trials did was they averaged chest compression fraction um, over the first 10 minutes in the cardiac arrest. And so in the group that got mechanical CPR, while it took about 36 seconds with no compressions to apply the device, when you average over the first 10 minutes, um, you see that they actually have improved chest compression fraction over that period. So to phrase it a little bit differently, you pay sort of upfront about a 30 second um, no compression time. And then over the, on average over your first 10 minutes, you get an improved chest compression fraction. Um, the other thing, so that's something to keep in mind. The other um, paper, which is the paramedic trial, had a small subgroup uh, or did a subgroup analysis looking at patients who presented in a shockable rhythm. And they actually found that those patients did worse with mechanical CPR. And their sort of plausible, plausibility explanation for this is that the study protocol required deployment of the device prior to defibrillation. And so potentially delays of defibrillation were introduced by that 30 second or 36 second uh, pause to de uh, deploy the device. Um, so the delay was not actually measured in that trial, but that was their sort of hypothesized 
um, plausibility explanation. So both of these sort of points, I think, uh, may illustrate why we're not seeing those drastic improvements that we kind of expect to see with our non-fatiguing and standardized CPR provided by these devices. Um, they do take a significant amount of time to deploy, especially in non-ideal settings. And that deployment, if it's delaying defibrillation, if it's delaying good quality coronary perfusion uh, during the first few minutes of a cardiac arrest, may be uh, detrimental. So I just want to kind of make a point of that because I really don't think the meta-analysis really captures those particular points. Um, but overall in the pre-hospital setting, we're not seeing uh, any dramatic changes in patient outcomes if they're getting manual CPR or mechanical CPR in all comers. When we look at the in-hospital cardiac arrest um, group, we again have a uh, met system, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that was performed. So they looked at three um, RCTs and six observational studies. Unfortunately, their quality analysis suggested that this, these were very low quality studies. They're quite small studies. Um, however, what they did find was that when we look at survival to hospital discharge, uh, we do see a, an association favoring mechanical um, CPR with an odds ratio of about 2.34. Um, there were two RCTs that used this particular outcome. And so we do see that potentially in a highly protocolized in-hospital cardiac arrest with a uh, well-rehearsed code team, these devices may uh, create a survival benefit. And furthermore, when we look at uh, short-term survival, so survival at one hour and rates of ROSC, we again see a signal in favor of mechanical CPR with an odds ratio of 2.14. Um, again, these were small studies. The quality of the evidence was low. Many of the markers of good quality RCTs were not listed. Um, so wh whether we can take this to the bank and suggest that this, these devices are beneficial in, in hospital cardiac arrest, I'm not sure. Um, but there is potentially a signal there that in those high resource settings, when we have lots of people to help us deploy the device quickly, when we have a highly rehearsed code team, um, there may be a benefit to these uh, standardized devices. Fortunately, there is new evidence coming. So compressed RCT, which you may or may, or may not remember, we already discussed um, when we talked about pauses uh, associated with, with deploying these devices. Um, but this was a feasibility randomized controlled trial. And they're essentially looking at the feasibility of doing a large multi-center uh, in-hospital cardiac arrest trial. And they found significant challenges with their feasibility trial, but as I understand it, they're moving forward with their, um, with their larger trial. So there is new evidence coming soon. Uh, so hopefully we'll get a better sense as to whether these devices are beneficial for in-hospital cardiac arrest. But I think at this point, there's not enough evidence to say that they are conclusively better than manual CPR. And then finally, I think the setting that we're most, we're all most interested in um, as emergency physicians is the emergency department. And I'm sad to have to announce that the evidence here is worse than any of the, either, any of the uh, previous two uh, locations. There's really only two trials that have looked at this particular setting. The first is this one here, uh, the SOS Kanto study. It's a multi-center uh, Japanese observational study. So observational study, non-controlled uh, trial. And they looked at about 6,500 cardiac arrest patients treated in the emergency department. This was a, I, I struggled to, or I, hesitate to even tell you the results of the study because I think it's a highly biased study. The decision as to whether to apply the device was made by the treating physician on a patient by patient basis. There was a high risk of selective enrollment. Um, they did feel that the device was associated with a reduced likelihood of ROSC um, and a reduced likelihood of hospital survival. But again, the selectivity there, I think, um, makes it difficult to draw any conclusions from this particular study. So I really would not, I don't put much store in this study. The second study, again, is not a randomized trial. It is not a controlled trial. It is a before and after uh, observational study in a Singapore uh, emergency department setting. And this, uh, the context here is that in this, particular, in this particular health region of Singapore, the decision was made to make mechanical CPR the standard of care in the emergency department. And so these researchers looked at the period of time before that standard of care uh, came into effect and the period of time afterwards. And they looked at about a thousand patients and they felt that they showed an association between um, mechanical CPR and improved ROSC, improved hospital survival and good neurological outcome. 
Um, but unfortunately, they had marked differences in baseline patient characteristics, initial rhythm, and cardiac arrest location. And so when they adjusted their analyses, um, the only significant difference that remained was that they showed um, an association between mechanical CPR and increased rates of ROSC. Um, but again, not a randomized controlled trial, not a very relatively low quality um, piece of evidence. What I do like about this study and what I think is very interesting is, please don't read this whole table yet, but I will explain why I think it's interesting. This group looked at, looked at and published um, the quality of the CPR and particularly their no flow times and no flow ratios uh, over the course of the resuscitation. And so this data was gathered, they had the pucks similar to what we have attached to our zoles that monitor compression quality, but they also had video recording, which was their standard of care, which they had in place for QI purposes that they were able to review. And so they were looking at um, NFT, which is no flow time or no flow ratios, NFR, which is essentially when we talk about no flow time, it's the time, the cumulative time in which there are no compressions ongoing. And so they looked at two different time points. They looked at the zero to five minute time point and then the five to 10 minute time point. And they compared manual CPR to the load to the auto pulse uh, CPR. And what I found to be quite interesting is that when we look at the no flow time in the first five minutes, um, so from the time the patient hits the doors to the time to five minutes after that, um, we can see that the time off the chest is quite significantly uh, longer in the auto pulse or the load distributing band LDB group. Um, so 114 seconds relative to 84 seconds. So lots more time off the chest um, in our mechanical CPR group there. However, when we look at the five to 10 minute time period, that trend reverses. And so we see there's actually less time off the chest once the auto pulse is on and deployed which again supports um, similar to what we had chatted about earlier with the link and CERC trials, that we pay the price up front when we apply these devices. We have a period of time where the patient's getting no compressions as we deploy the device. But once it's on, we seem to be a bit more efficient uh, with our um, chest compressions, with our pulse checks and our defibrillation checks. The other uh, part here is that their CPR ratio, um, which is the percentage of uninterrupted CPR in the entire resuscitation, Again, when you look at the entire resuscitation averaging over a longer period of time, we can see that in the auto pulse or the mechanical group, um, it was, it was uh, significantly higher, 50%, although not nearly that 80% that we're striving for with good quality CPR. So I've presented a lot of evidence and the last you know, kind of area I wanted to explore is the question as to whether mechanical CPR is safe. There's been a lot of theoretical uh, risk to uh, solid organs, to the chest wall. Um, there's a lot of case reports out there looking at these catastrophic injuries that have happened both with mechanical CPR, but also with manual CPR um, and these catastrophic sort of injuries that, that can occur. Really, there's been multiple retrospective studies, only two actual prospective studies performed to look at this particular outcome. Um, and the, the best of those is this one here. Um, and these folks actually did a non-inferiority randomized controlled trial um, of 374 patients who were randomized to receive Lucas CPR, autopulse CPR, uh, or to continue to receive manual CPR. And their primary outcome was actually serious or life-threatening resuscitation-related visceral organ damage. Um, and they were they had quite good uh, attrition. They had or uh, they had quite good outcome data. They got about 90% of um, patients' uh, data. They requested to do autopsies on any patients who were deceased. If that was approved, they performed an autopsy. If that was not approved by family, they did a postmortem CT scan to try to ascertain what injuries were available were there. For any patients who survived, they followed clinical course and any imaging, any operative interventions to get a sense as to what uh, injuries were uh, sustained. And so when we Compare uh, to manual CPR, the non-inferiority analysis showed that Lucas did not increase the risk of injury compared to manual CPR. Um, however, they did not achieve their non-inferiority margin uh, for the autopulse device. So an increase in injury could not be ruled out uh, for that particular device. It also bears, to, bears mention that the paramedic link and CERC trials were designed to examine the clinical effectiveness of mechanical devices rather than specifically to examine injuries. But these trials did not also, or also did not report a difference in injury patterns or severity um, between patients receiving manual and mechanical chest compressions. So while they weren't necessarily powered for that, um, we didn't, didn't see that. 
So I've now talked at you for about 45 minutes and I've presented quite a few studies um, in rapid fire, uh, rapid fire sequence. So how do we put it all together and how do we make a decision clinically about whether we want to use these devices in what capacity we want to use them, whether we want to use them in the emergency department. And the fortunate part is that we don't have to. <laughs> we have guidelines and we have groups of experts who have sat down and made some recommendations. So I want to quickly go through those because I think they are reasonable recommendations. And they start um, with the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation or ILCOR. And their most recent, um, or the first time they sort of mentioned these devices is 2015. And they, their suggestion at that time was they suggested against the routine use of these devices. Um, again, based on moderate quality evidence. So they said, you know, we should not be exclusively or routinely using these devices. However, they did suggest that there were situations where, and to quote them, sustained high quality manual chest compressions are impractical or may compromise provider safety. And they provide a list of those um, scenarios, including, you know, those prolonged resuscitations where we have the fatigue factor. We talk about um, providing compressions in the back of an ambulance or on a helicopter with our HEM services. We talk about uh, prolonged compressions while we wait for ECMO cannulation, while we wait for coronary angiography. Um, while we wait in a hypothermic arrest. And so in those scenarios, they said it was reasonable to use these devices. They then updated these recommendations in 2020. And the only change that they made to those recommendations was to add a caveat in the COVID-19 population and to add that to the group um, or to the list of exclusions where this might be a reasonable uh, device to use. So they suggested that in a situation where you may have constrained PPE or you may have constrained space because you're operating or you're working in a closet like some of our, our uh, negative pressure rooms were initially. Um, in those scenarios, having an extra person out of the room, having one less person using PPE, one less person exerting themselves and potentially generating aerosols in the room um, might be a reasonable uh, situation in which to deploy one of these mechanical devices. When we look at the European Resuscitation Council guidelines, they're very similar, um, and you'll hear a common thread through all of these guidelines. They think that mechanical CPR is reasonable to consider in selected cases, not for routine use. So again, those, need, those patients needing prolonged CPR in confined spaces and in situations where rescuer safety or fatigue is a large consideration. And then finally, moving closer to home, the American Heart Association guidelines again suggest against the use of routine or the routine use of these devices but do feel that there are specific settings where high quality compressions may be challenging or dangerous um, and again similar to what we have uh, have mentioned thus far so as far as my takeaways um, from the, the reading i've done to prepare these grand rounds i i agree with many of these guidelines and i think my takeaways will be very similar um, I put them in sort of what I hope will be a more fun and memorable format. Um, this is one of my favorite playlists on Spotify. There used to be just one, now there's several um, playlists with songs to do CPR to. So these are all songs that have a beat of 100 to 120 beats per minute. And um, essentially I've used those to kind of frame my takeaway points. So the first is, I'm sorry, um, the in-hospital cardiac arrest and emergency department evidence is not robust yet. Uh, there are uh, studies ongoing that will hopefully give us some more insight as to the utility of these devices in these settings, but there's really not enough evidence for us to uh, suggest using them exclusively at this point. All of the studies that we've presented, certainly all of the RCTs and many of the observational studies suggest that uh, mechanical CPR early in a cardiac arrest is potentially harmful. So when we are applying this, uh, these devices, and they're de delaying defibrillation when we're applying these devices and they're um, delaying our good quality chest compressions before that first defibrillation in particular, um, there may be a potential harm there, particularly in those patients who have shockable rhythms. So I think deploying these devices immediately in every cardiac arrest may or may not be, may not be um, beneficial to the patient. However, that's gonna be balanced by your resource setting and the safety of your providers. And so it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Mechanical CPR is reasonable in prolonged resuscitations. For example, in our refractory VT and VF patients, um, patients getting cannulated for ECMO in our hypothermic cardiac arrests. Uh, if you anticipate you're going to be doing compressions for a week, I think deploying these devices might be reasonable. Again, using these devices in resource limited settings, in the pre-hospital setting, in the rural emergency department where you may have only one physician, 
uh, and one nurse and you're you know looking to offload um, a set of responsibilities I think letting mechanical CPR do your compressions while you do other things is very reasonable and then I'll just reiterate similarly to what um, the American Heart Association has reiterated in their 2020 update that the priority number one should always be high quality and evidence-based compressions with early defibrillation where appropriate and if these devices fit into your institutional plan to achieve that, then I think that's extremely reasonable, but we should not be um, deploying these devices if we feel that that will not be accomplished. And so I'll leave you with a kind of parting thought um, and potentially a uh, face-off, if you will. In the top left, many of you will recognize our beloved Jimmy, uh, one of our emergency department te techs at uh, University Hospital, provides some of the best compressions I've ever seen. And in the bottom right, we have our Lucas device, and I will let you, I'm gonna take you through very quickly a case. You've seen one of the TE clips already, um, but it was a case that uh, presented in cardiac arrest with Lucas in situ. And I will uh, show you sort of how things progressed and you can make a decision as to who you want performing compressions in your next resuscitation. So you've seen this clip before. Um, this is the patient with Lucas on, um, where we're seeing relatively inadequate ventricular um, compressions and we see that large intracardiac thrombus. Shortly thereafter, uh, Lucas was removed and Jimmy took over. And uh, you can see quite a marked difference in the movement of, uh, of the cardiac structures there. And you can see even some breaking up of that uh, thrombus. As we progress uh, through the resuscitation, we can see several minutes later that that thrombus is almost gone now, again, seeing good compressions of the heart. And I will uh, leave it to you to answer for yourself, who do you have in that particular heavyweight fight? And at this point, I will uh, turn the mic over to anyone who has questions, comments, any anecdotal experiences with these devices or anything to add. Danielle. Yep. Hi, my name's uh, Dax Biani. I'm the uh, chief of the Department of Emergency Medicine in Chatham. And um, I'm actually acting as the protected code blue doctor today on call. Um, I work in a, a, one of our other sites in Wallsburg. Um, and I, I can say I, I've been an advocate for the uh, Lucas um, for over a year now. We actually bought three of them for our two hospitals last um, February, just kind of as the pandemic was ramping up. And it's been an invaluable uh, contribution to our uh, continuum of uh, advanced cardiac life support care. I thought I'd make the comment, uh, in Wallsburg, we only have um, four nurses on, and then the physician. And in Chatham, we don't have any learners most of the time. Sometimes we do, but there's really no extra bodies to do CPR. And it's been awesome to you know, allow for high quality compression while maintaining department flow. In the um, inpatient units, we use it as well. And uh, there it's uh, with the whole protected code blue kind of format more to keep other people out of the room. So I just wanted to comment that um, we're using it, I think we're using it effectively. Um, in Chatham Kent, we also have some prolonged transport times from um, some of the other areas, like uh, you know, 20 minute transports are not uncommon. Um, I'm, not, I'm advocating for EMS to buy them. Our service doesn't currently carry any in their trucks, but uh, you know, for the reasons you presented around EMS safety, uh, I think it'd be an amazing addition and I'd like to see them have them on their trucks. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for uh, providing that. Like, I think I don't have a lot of experience in those pre-hospital, well, in those sort of limited resource settings. I'm working out in four counties a little bit more recently, but haven't yet had to experience that particular uh, episode. But I do, I agree with you. I think certainly in those limited resources settings, whether it's pre-hospital or like you say, in that sort of rural emergency department, in terms of freeing up a set of skilled hands to do other tasks, I think that there's a huge role for these. And like you said, I think for provider safety in the back of a in the back of an ambulance, I think doing compressions, moving through the city, turning corners, like I think there's a lot of potential for injury there, um, if if people aren't careful. So thank you very much for the sort of practical experience there. I see, I see a comment from Julie. Um, Yeah, so I think I'm just reading Julie's comment in the chat there. 
Um, so most of these, these devices should have a uh, AC plug-in. And so just, I guess, requesting that when you request the device, if you are using it in the emergency department would be important. Um, because yeah, I have used them on, a, on occasion in the emergency department for hypothermic rest predominantly. And uh, just, yeah, ensuring that when you, <laughs> when you deploy the device before you let anyone leave, um, make sure that you have the cord, I guess, to plug them in would be sort of a thought for sure. Hi, Danielle. Thanks for a great talk. I'm one of the uh, med students uh, on the EM service right now. Um, I do have s some experience with uh, a third device called the Thumper. I'm a nurse in, uh, in Detroit prior to my uh, stint here. Um, it's not as uh, freestanding as, as the Lucas or the Autopulse, and it does actually consume a pair of hands just to keep the device stable. Uh, so unfortunately, it's not going to free up some hands, but uh, oftentimes I see poor uh, quality CPR with these devices as well. And uh, I've, I've been an advocate for manual CPR uh, for most of my career. And, um, and in Windsor, we use the Lucas. And again, I think the time to uh, apply the devices is, is far too, uh, uh, too much. And, and uh, it, it's always often in uh, improper positioning or uh, you know, not getting the best compressions. Yeah, thanks, David, for weighing in. And I think I agree with you. I think there's certainly there's certainly are drawbacks to these devices, um, particularly in high resource settings. Like I think in the emergency department, the only time that I could see using this myself in the emergency department would be in those cardiac arrests where I anticipate we're going to be doing compressions for three, four hours while we rewarm someone. Um, because I agree with you. I think when we have lots of hands and we have lots of people to pay attention to the quality of compressions and to switch out, I think you know, as particularly in the early parts of resuscitation, doing 30 seconds without compressions for me is kind of a daunting thing to think about um, while we deploy the device. And so, I th yeah, so I think it comes down to sort of looking at your setting and looking at the risk benefits of these devices and whether it makes sense for you. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention too much about the Thumper because we don't use it. It's not being used really much in Canada at all. Um, but there are, there certainly are other devices kind of out there, out and about, and there are many more coming as well that are supposed to be able to monitor the quality of compressions and, and perform other tasks. There are some that, um, including the Lucas, but there are others that will manually um, decompress the chest as well, as well as compressing. So, um, potentially lots more coming in this field, but yeah, I appreciate the uh, sort of practical experience with it. Just to respond to that really in brief, um, this is Luckett, by the way, uh, I completely agree with that and uh, moreover agree that in instances where you're going to be doing CPR for a really prolonged period of time, it's invaluable. I, in Hamilton, have run a, a seven hour hypothermic arrest trying to get somebody warmed where we didn't have a Lucas and to muster, oh sorry, animals are fighting now in my office now that I started talking, um, to muster the sort of manpower it takes to go on for seven hours when somebody's arresting and you're putting in chest tubes, uh, you know, to warm and, and what have you. And we had somebody else who uh, was arresting in the room next door. Uh, it's a huge amount of resources. And I think that what you described, Danielle, of having that, you know, sudden switchover where you go from having a, a poor compression ratio to having a better compression ratio as the, um, as the resuscitation goes on becomes really salient when you have these incredibly long resuscitations. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Thanks, Marianne. Hey, it's Mason. Uh, just, uh, I'm in Windsor right now, actually, and just had a code uh, yesterday with one of these um, in the eMERGE because uh, I come in with the paramedics. And, and I can say, like, I mean, it's interesting to talk about the efficacy of them versus manual CPR, but I think there's also something to be said for the workflow. Even when you do have the people available, it's nice to just have a quiet room with CPR ongoing. The patient is intubated and being bagged. And you can sit and think. There's not people running around. There's not a huge commotion. Like, it just provides such a, a better work environment that, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's not quantifiable in a study or maybe it's not, um, you know, easily measurable, but uh, I, I think there's just a night and day difference between that. Even when you do have like a massive number of learners that can make it happen, the room is just so much calmer and you can think so much more clearly when there's a Lucas on instead of thinking about, okay, is this person doing compressions? And they'll stop compressions and say, no, actually I want you to continue. Whereas with the device, it just keeps going until you push the, bot the off button. And when you push the on button, it starts again. Like there's, there's really no question about it. It just makes everything simpler. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point as well, for sure.
Danielle, as John, just a, a comment on that comment. I think, I think again, you, you've already pointed it out, but the downside there is that I think there would, there's a tendency to forget about how well and how, how well positioned the device is and how well it's actually performing CPR. So it, 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 it's a trade-off. So long as you're confident in your ability to monitor and you remember to do that rather than just sitting back calmly and ordering the drugs and, you know, checking the rhythm and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think that that's a, a real problem, particularly in environments where um, physicians don't see a lot of cardiac arrests. Um, so, you know, it, it, there, there's obviously tremendous benefit, particularly in, in rural areas and where your, your human resources are very limited. Um, but there are, I think, still significant downsides. And, and just one other parting question. Uh, I saw Jimmy was on on the uh, <clears throat> was watching rounds today, and I just wonder if you would mind if we uh, clone him. I don't expect to reply, Jimmy. <laughs> Great talk, Danielle. I think Jimmy Jimmy flexed for us all, so I wish we could clone him. Hey, Danielle, it's uh, Todd Martin. I'm one of the paramedics, uh, actually in Lambton County. Um, did you find much? Uh, information out there about shock sinking, so the continuous uh, CPR going with uh, the shock of the defib. I know uh, Zoll was doing that for a while, and was there any better outcomes with that? I don't think I, as far as I know, it's not been studied in any sort of meaningful way thus far. Um, I did come across the the protocols from the various different studies are a bit uh, perplexing, and so I didn't go into all of the details there. Um, with some of them diverge from what we know to be sort of like high quality CPR and made other protocols as to when you would shock and when you would do compressions and at what ratios. Um, I don't have any specific answers about that as far as what the research shows. I know that some, like it has been done, um, but I don't think it's been studied in a sort of meaningful way thus far from what I came across. Well, I think we're coming up on 9.59 by my clock. So um, thank you everyone for your attention, for the excellent uh, discussion at the end and for um, the sort of anecdotal experiences everyone was able to provide, um, certainly more than I have had myself personally thus far. Um, and at this point I will uh, end things, but thank you. Great job, Danielle. Thanks so much, Danielle. Thanks, Danielle. <clears throat>